Well, good morning. Hey, let's continue this time of worship, and let's just ask the Lord to speak to us in a mighty way. Our Father, we thank you for the chance to have this word that you've given us that is a lamp into our feet. And as we strive to figure out where we are going, what we're doing, who we are, all these things, as we find ourselves in the everyday grind, we just want to be mindful of the fact that we are in need of you. We know you're with us, so we welcome you and ask that you would move in our hearts, that we would be open to the word that you have for us, specifically for our own lives, that your spirit would quicken us to see how we can lean closer to you, to draw from you as our source and our guide. And may it result in fruit that pleases you. And all God's people said, amen. Well, we are all in the process of being formed. We rarely stop to notice, but this process of shaping is a basic reality of human existence. I'm not just talking about spiritual formation. I'm talking about formation, which includes spiritual formation. And everyone is in a process of formation. Robert Mulholland writes this. Every thought we hold, every decision we make, every action that we take, every emotion we allow to shape our behavior, every response we make to the world around us, every relationship we enter into, Every reaction we have toward the things that surround us and impinge upon our lives, all of these things, little by little, are shaping us into some kind of being. We are all being formed. We're being shaped either into the wholeness of the image of Christ, Christoformity, as we've talked about in this series, or a horribly destructive character of that image. Destructive not only to ourselves, but also to others. For we inflict our brokenness upon others when we aren't whole. Don't list that last part. When we're not participating in being formed by Christ, Christ Christoformity, then we are being shaped into a destructive character of what it means to be human. And this destruction not only affects our relationship with God and ourselves, but our relationship with others, for we inflict our brokenness upon them. You see, we're either becoming agents of God's healing and liberating grace, or we're carriers of sickness in this world. And the direction of our growth invites others deeper into either life or death. You see, currently here at Epic Church, we are in a series that's dealing with the life and ministry of Christ, and we're calling this series Christoformity. Christoformity is rooted in Jesus' own words and his life. The goal of Christoformity is not only to just believe the the gospel, but to embody it. It's what happens when we participate in Christ relationally through his way of life, and it's human formation and functioning at its finest. As for this morning, I want us to turn to the table of mercy. If you have your Bibles, I want you to grab them. If not, I'll have the, we'll have the text behind me. And I want us to look at Matthew 9, and I want us to see, as we're being shaped, a message that's given to us that's important for us to see as to what it means to be formed and to follow Jesus in particular. Matthew chapter 9, verse 9 through 13. It begins with this. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew, also known as Levi, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up. Another word for this of really understanding is he raised up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, 
but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call the righteous, not them, but sinners. Have you ever been told, don't hang out with the wrong crowd? Well, as you can see, Scripture is a little different in some ways because it kind of tells us to, in certain ways at least, hang out with the wrong crowd, right? And I'm, I'm going to say that obviously this is in appropriate ways. I mean, hear me out. I'm not condoning or ignoring sinful behavior of people who live lives that are anti-Christ. I'm also not saying you shouldn't be around other believers. That's quite the opposite of what I'm saying. I'm simply saying you can't read Scripture without seeing that Jesus hung out with the rough crowd. He hung out with the outcasts, the misfits. He spent time leaning in, calling people out to come and follow Him. You see, Jesus' selfless love extends to all people from all walks of life. And that's great when it deals with us, our family, and our friends. But when it deals with other people that we're not so fond of, that's a tough thing for us to wrestle with. And that's what the Pharisees, I think, are dealing with here. Because this love includes shady tax collectors like Matthew. You see, in Jesus' time, a tax collector was considered a traitor, basically. It was a Jew who ripped off fellow Jews to help out the Roman government, all while taking, all while taking a nice cut for himself. And so most people probably already had a hard time financially. There wasn't really a middle class. There was just really upper and lower class. So it'd be easy to hate someone in this position. In fact, given that tax collectors and sinners here in our text are considered one and the same, means that Matthew can accurately be described as a shady character. Yet, despite his background, Jesus asked this ungodly man to follow him. And he did. Matthew was drawn to Jesus, influenced by Jesus, and in turn, at this junction in his life, decided to follow Jesus. Jesus didn't push Matthew away because of his shady profession or his shady behavior. Instead, Jesus leaned in. He broke down barriers, and he invited Matthew to a higher and to a truer calling. Matthew experienced... A radical change of heart. He gave up everything to follow Jesus. In fact, this transformation was so life-changing that he held a party where he invited all of his friends, who were also considered ungodly, to come and meet Jesus. And it's at this table of fellowship where you can see, once again, the loving truth that all people from all walks of life are invited to share in God's grace. No one is excluded from God's table of mercy. We're all invited to the table. No one's too far gone. No one's too sinful. No one's untouchable. Jesus came so that all people might come to know Him through faith. He's given us all, you, your family, your friends, your neighbors, and even your enemies, the opportunity to become his sons and daughters. This is good news for all of us. Like Matthew, the question is, are we willing to follow Jesus, to drop everything? And it's not really just about as much of being ready to follow Jesus as it is being willing. And sometimes even when we decide to follow Jesus, we lose a bit of this. We get caught up in the aspect of we aren't ready, but Jesus doesn't call those who are, who are ready. He calls those who are willing. As we've already discussed throughout this series, following Jesus costs you everything. But it's worth it. Imagine life without Christ. You can't once you've tasted and seen how good He is. It leads us to the cross journey, but it ends in resurrection. We're all invited to the table of mercy. You are invited to the table of mercy. There's no favoritism, segregation, or discrimination at this table. All are welcome. Come 
just as you are, as the old hymn says. But know this, you will leave changed. You will leave changed. Jesus came to heal the sick. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, he says. And Jesus continues to heal the sick. And who is the sick? All of us. You, me, everyone. We're all in need of healing. We're all sinners. We've all missed the mark, as you may have heard. We've missed the target. And we've even aimed at the wrong target. We all need someone to clean up the mess that we've made in our lives with the dysfunction and the brokenness and the sin around us. We need someone to address this, to clean up our mess. And believe it or not, you cannot rely on yourself alone. Let me say that again. Some of us think either A, we aren't good enough to come to Jesus, or B, when we come to Jesus, we have to earn His grace and love once we're there because we don't really deserve it. But we need to know that Jesus meets us where we're at, and He's the one that changes. He's the one that transforms. Now, according to the religious leaders of Jesus' day, these Pharisees, a sinner was one who didn't fit their mold, who didn't follow their overbearing religious rules, measure up to some spiritual status, or play this spiritual game that they played. But this isn't Jesus' definition of a sinner. From a biblical perspective, if we were to say, what is a sinner? It's simply one who opposes the will of God. And we all fall into that camp. No one's righteous, no, not one, says Romans 3. And without Christ, we are as good as dead. Slaves to sin, we need help and we are all sick. But fortunately, there is a cure. Christ offers a remedy. He can heal us, make us whole. Behold, He makes all things new, which includes our brokenness and the brokenness of our world around us. Have you had an opportunity to be cured and healed? And those that have, are you, continuing to lead, are you continuing to follow hard after Christ, knowing that He heals spiritually, physically, emotionally, all of these things? Jesus came to heal the sick, but there is a cure as we think about our own sin. In fact, the meta-narrative of the Bible as a whole is that God's focused on overcoming Adam's sin and bringing people to Himself who continue to reject His mercy. But if we're willing, Jesus will turn our lives around and do great things, mighty things, that we couldn't even ask or imagine in and through us if we will allow Him. And so if He can use a despised tax collector, He can use each of us to do great things. We're all sick, but there's a cure. You know, sometimes we as uh, followers of Jesus, which I'm assuming a strong majority, if not all of us in this room, are followers of Jesus. We hear this and it's as if we already know this. But let this wash over you, the fact that you are invited to the table of mercy. And the host that invites you loves you. He wants to intimately be engaged with you in a relationship. He wants to provide for you, counsel you, lead you, and guide you. That's what this mercy is available to us. This is the type of mercy that's available to us. And we must not lose sight of this. We must not minimize this. Because sometimes we brush it off, just run quite right past it and forget to see that this is, this is the good news for us. And it doesn't take long to see that we are running around in our anger, our envy, our pride, our gossip, our bitterness. There's a better way. We're sick and we don't need to forget that we need to turn to the cure. And Christ is that cure. He is our remedy. He desires to heal us and make us whole and continues to take care of us when we turn to Him. This good news should inspire us to know that we're never beyond the grasp of God's loving mercy. Some of you this morning may need to know that. You're beat down every week. You question your faith. Doubt starts to surface and bubble. I'm not a good enough mom. 
I'm lonely. Does anyone care about me? I'm getting older. Am I missing my opportunity? We all have struggles. And they're genuinely facing us daily. And we don't want them to be the one that has the only word. Because it should inspire us to know we're never out of the reach of God's mercy and love. His forgiveness. His grace. This should also inspire us as we feast upon the Lord to invite others to join us. As we taste and see and we receive this healing, why would we not want to share this with others? And so to sum up what's happening here in this text, I want you to see we are being invited. Come to the table of mercy to find healing. And invite others to join. You see, this brings us back to where we started. When we aren't following Jesus, we attempt to self-medicate our brokenness. How many of you this past year have Googled an illness or symptom? I'm talking physical. Raise your hand. Thank you for some honesty. Exactly. Okay? And this is what we do with our spiritual lives. We lean on our own understanding. We trust our own feelings way too much. We mimic our culture's way of coping in hopes that it will be the solution we desire. We do anything we can to numb the pain that's in front of us. And sometimes we gain temporary relief or decent advice. Sometimes Google's right. Most of the time it's not. We gain bits of helpful information, but when we never consult the great physician, we end up putting a Band-Aid on a severed artery. And we wonder why our relationships don't thrive. Why we're cynical and can't ever seem to find that thing called joy. Where peace isn't possible without some sort of numbing mechanism. And so the only cure to our brokenness, what do we do with this mess, is Christ. And what I mean by that is if you want to find a cure to your life-draining substance abuse, a remedy for your dysfunctional relationships, a solution for your shattered self-worth, healing from your secret sin, or be restored from the sin and shame that surrounds you, you must turn to the healer. And he doesn't just heal us physically, though that's what we're going to talk about next week. Physically, we see God do some miraculous things, but he wants to go deeper than that. And we can't miss this miracle of salvation, the gift that you can have your sins forgiven, that you can be loved, taken care of, and given a new life, new community, new identity. That's what's offered with this gospel. And we need to be reminded of this gospel over and over. We need to make sure we're trusting the great physician. And we need each other to do this. I'm thankful for doctors so that I don't have to depend on Google all the time. But far be it that I don't go and visit a physician. I'm thankful that we have those around us who know the Word of God, who are in direct relationship with God, that they can encourage us, spur us on, be healing to our lives. We all want to be made whole. We want to flourish as humans. And so while some people still refuse to believe that they're sick, or that Jesus is the great physician, that invitation remains. And it's an ongoing following that we would continue to lean on the source of life that's found in Christ. His way of life. His love. His intimate relationship that is offered to us. But you know, as we think about this and how this is so powerful to our own lives, we cannot miss... One of the greatest things about this passage and one of the greatest passages on this issue. Because while we can't refuse to realize that Jesus brings about this cure, when we do feast upon the Lord and we taste and see His goodness, His greatness, then we're forever changed. And we can't help but tell others about this. About this cure. About this wholeness. And so while we as Christians continue to follow Jesus, others need to the good news. You know, if we had a cure to the coronavirus right now, not only would we be rich, 
but we would tell everyone. And here we are having the greatest remedy to people's brokenness, and we hold it to ourselves. We let fear cripple us. We assume I'm not the one that's capable to do this. That's what Moses thought. I'm too sinful. That's what David could have said. You go through the list of heroes of faith, and we're in good company when we look that we're all sick. But when you see a physician, and you find a cure, and someone else is sick as well, you want to tell them about how they can be cured. I'm not trying to minimize the coronavirus this morning. But I am trying to say that there is a sense of us coming together this morning to say that we're sick and we need Christ. And there's also people all around us that we see and talk to and interact with each and every day that they need healing. They need a word of life. And we have that. And so here's my question as we begin to think about how this applies to us. Who can you pray for that you know is in need of healing? Jesus didn't look at them as some diseased-ridden group of people. We don't have projects around us. We have fellow patients that are sick. And we need to point them in the right direction. So our heart and compassion like Christ needs to be right. But who do you know that you can begin to pray for that needs to know that they are loved and can be healed? Who can you invite to be a part of a community, this church? Who can you start up a conversation with this week about Christ? And who can you ask perhaps, how can I pray for you? I want us to be intentional this week about sharing Christ with someone. And here's what I want you to do right now where you're at. I just want you to bow your heads and I want you to ask the Lord to remind you that He is the great physician. Start there. He loves you. He wants what's best for you. Allow His grace and mercy to wash over you, to forgive you, to quicken your heart as to how you can trust Him more and rid yourself of the fear and the brokenness, and the sin that shackles your life. And as we offer this prayer of healing, oh God, have mercy on us. May we begin to shift our eyes from ourselves a bit to others. Who is someone that you know that God is laying on your heart? We don't save people, He does. But we can love them and encourage them to see that we're all in need of a Savior and that we all serve some Lord. We're all being formed. And so to question the formations that are taking place around us, I think people at the realistic approach to life would say, thank you for questioning this. And so ask the Lord to reveal to you someone that you can share God's grace and mercy with, an invitation to His table of mercy. Who is God putting on your heart? How can we be intentional? You know, it starts with prayer. Commit to pray for them every day this week. Who is that one in your heart and your life? You see the parables of Jesus talking about leaving the 99 sheep to find the lost one. To up, turn upside down the house where the widow strives to find that lost coin. And the prodigal son that desires to run out and meet those who are waiting. I don't want us to become bitter and cynical cynical and angry. I want us to see that we've been forgiven much. And we have a chance to offer the hope of Jesus to others. Who's that one? You know, Easter's coming up and it's an opportunity to talk about some of these things as a church and in our community with our family and friends. We exist, if you think about life from a biblical perspective, to love God and love people. And listen to this. If we aren't in right relationship with God, we won't be in right relationship with others. But when we're in a right relationship with God ourselves, we will seek to be in right relationship with others. It goes hand in hand. And so, oh God, this morning I pray 
that you would allow us to see someone in our life. Someone in our life that is in need of your grace and mercy. That we first would receive it ourselves and see you for who you truly are. And would we perhaps have the opportunity this week to share with someone that you love them and that we love them. Help us to have conversations in our passings and in our family groups, perhaps at lunch today, of different ways that we can naturally see that you are already working around us and in our relationships. We just have to point to you. Oh God, may next week we see someone come through these doors that doesn't know you. May someone have an opportunity to share the gospel to someone who doesn't have a relationship with you and they receive you. Lord, may we never lose sight that you are working and moving and we have a chance to be a part of that. You're moving all throughout our world. You are still the miracle maker. And so would you work in our lives to bring healing to us and to those around us.